Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So we're recording this in middle of May 2020, and as we speak, parts of the United States and also parts of the world are beginning to come out of lockdown, restrictions are easing, but that's not universally true, and uh, other places are going back into lockdown as we face a COVID-19 crisis. Deb, Joseph, and I are clinicians. We're hearing from people in our practice. We're experiencing it in uh, ourselves. Uh, what does it do to the psyche to be locked down for such a long period of time? How is that affecting us? And we thought we'd take that on this week. The first place I'm going, Lisa, is reflecting on my clients. You know, almost my whole practice has moved into Zoom, as a people, are, of course, are anxious. And people look frayed. Um, they both physically look frayed, as well as the comments that they're sharing. That image of a piece of fabric with the ends just being pulled apart and threads dangling. Even physically, people are often look less kept, which is often a sign of tremendous amount of stress. I've noticed this surprisingly um, with my really introverted clients as well. In the beginning of this lockdown isolation period, a number of the introverted clients said it was extraordinary, even exquisite, to have all of these extroverted expectations just lifted off of them. It was like a, an international snow day for a while. <laughs> That's great. But now I'm hearing from those same clients as they sometimes burst into tears, how much they miss not seeing a physical person, not having even a momentary hug with someone. Mm -hmm. and this is very acute for people who are single, especially. I have noticed very much the same thing. It's much harder on people who live alone uh, than it is uh, on people that have partners and, and children. And I'm just thinking that it's our nature to be social animals and to have physical contact with one another. Birds flock and whales pod and fish school. And we herd, we're herd animals like horses. And we want to be bumping up against one another and, and jostling. And then I'm thinking about all the communication that takes place sort of under the surface uh, of stuff that doesn't, quote, matter very much. Uh, but it really does, such as, uh, you know, pass the sugar, and has anybody seen my other gym shoe, and of all that little give and take stuff that is part of the fabric of daily living, if you live alone, you've been getting that at work or in an exchange with people on the street, your neighbors, and all of a sudden, it's gone. Yeah, and, and thank goodness we have things like Zoom or FaceTime, but it's not the same exact. No, and it uses different neurons, and people have been writing about it. Of It requires much more of our attention, of, of visual attention and imaginal attention, but we miss a lot of the body language because we see heads and shoulders and maybe hands. Um, and it is, after all, a screen. It's not the embodied presence with all of those you know, other nonverbal uh, avenues of communication. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's something about, I'm appreciating what you said about introverts, Joseph, and I'm finding that myself, I'm, I'm actually fairly introverted. And, and I, you know, I have many clients who are introverts who at first, you know, were so excited about this, but, but now it's, it is hard. It, it's hard if you live alone, as you were saying, I mean, I think there's a real vulnerability if you live alone. But even for those who don't, I mean, I, I find that relationship dynamics are heating up as people are spending more and more time with maybe their partner. Um, it becomes quite a vessel, the, the four walls of our house, when we're just knocking around with the same people all the time. And it, it stretches us. It requires something of us. You know, someone was saying to me um, something about how this is sort of like during wartime, when a generation may miss some critical years of development. And I'm thinking about all of the young people who are finishing high school or graduating from college and all of the things that they won't have. You know, it's not exactly like wartime because the demand here is just to sit in your room and watch too much Netflix. And there's a real you know, you can fall into a real apathy. That's exactly it, Lisa. I'm imagining from the stories that I heard uh, from my parents and an aunt and uncle of World War II experience, that they really, there was a lot of contact and there were parties and people pooled their ration coupons, whereas this is isolated And uh, the feeling of apathy uh, and disconnect is the opposite of uh, what I imagine happened in in wartime. Even though here on Cape Cod, there are signs on people's front lawns that say we're in it together. We're all in it together. But it doesn't feel like that because every time I go to the supermarket, there's a sign that says, wear your mask. I say it a little more uh, cordially than that, but it's a double message of are we all in it together when we have to be suspicious and wary of one another? Uh, So it's our our social and physical isolation is reinforced uh, with the masks and the distancing and the wariness that we have to have toward one another. I think that tension is really, really significant As you brought up earlier, Deb, there is a comforting mammalian herd instinct that we just naturally feel in in any number of different ways. And the desire to group is now infected with the feeling that anyone we're grouped with could be a loaded COVID gun that's putting myself or anybody else at risk. So the war between the instinct to group and the tension that that could be dangerous is a kind of classic neurotic structure that psychoanalysts talk about. Whenever a natural instinct just wants to flow unobstructed and something or other blocks that off, people become symptomatic. Yeah, our instincts are thwarted. I'm also thinking about um, how our all kinds of complexes are uh, really being called up. And I'm thinking about our parental complexes uh, that we kind of superimpose on whoever is the governor of your state uh, and the country, you know, whether we're really being taken care of and whether things are being well managed which takes us back to that child place of, you know, do mom and dad really know what to do? Do they really have this? Uh, Are things going to be okay for us kids? And that there's sort of a parallel structure between that and uh, the governmental authorities and superior powers that are supposed to know what to do. They're supposed to be prepared. And it's very fragmented. Some states are opening up. Some states never closed down. Some states are still locked down. And so I think it feels like a a disorganized, therefore anxiety-producing 
uh, superstructure. So we're in that realm of regression. And Mm. that in general, when people are under enough stress, they're vulnerable to backing into some previous structure of the psyche to feel, think, behave younger than they really are, both chronologically and psychologically. And with that regression, there's less regulation in the personality and also expectations that parental figures will take responsibility for certain things to reduce their anxiety. I want to pick up on this idea about this kind of paternalism and this idea about regression. I mean, first of all, I think uh, from the standpoint of public health managing a pandemic, that's that's one thing, right? And it does require a coordinated response, and it does require that people listen to uh, authority figures who really know about this stuff. I mean, there does have to be a coordinated community response, okay? But psychologically, we're in this place where the need to pursue the hero's journey is thwarted. There isn't a heroic response to this crisis. The heroic response is supposedly stay home and watch Netflix. (laughs) There isn't an avenue to make an impact or to respond to it with, with, you know, actively, unless you're a, you know, frontline worker. I mean, you know, of course there, there are some, but open to most of us, no, you know, we're being told just to, to stay home. And that really cuts off a sense of agency and it cuts off this sense of um, stretching into something and testing our metal and trying to meet a frightening situation with courage. So it does put us back in this regressed place uh, where we are kind of subject to uh, just the whims of the cultural paternal uh, figures. Um, And I want to say that I think a danger is that we can fall in, just kind of collapse ourselves into that regression. So maybe we were in a situation where we were developing good habits. We were, you know, watching our sleep. We were waking up early to exercise. We were working to be as productive as possible throughout the day. We were pursuing goals. We had that forward moving ego energy toward goals then suddenly lockdown comes and perhaps some of those goals are no longer on the table. Maybe they're things that are not going to be possible now. Or the structures have been removed from our life. Now we don't have to show up at the office at a certain time. We can wake up whenever we want or whatever it is. You don't even really have to get dressed. You don't even really have to get dressed. <laughs> and and how tempting it is just to collapse into that. I'm definitely finding this with people who are just saying, I'm just wasting so much time or, you know, I'm, I'm back to smoking pot every day or whatever it is. It's almost like we have to kind of struggle against just getting sucked down into apathy. And, and I'm thinking about just the sort of the structurelessness of that, um, as you said, that, you know, maybe getting up and going out for a, a walk or a jog and then coming home and then have breakfast, take a shower, go to work. Here, one day is very much like the next. Yeah, I heard this great new phrase the other day, blurs day. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, Perfect. That's, gr- that's really great. I have uh, a colleague. We had a meeting. It's on everybody's schedule. Of, she was able to come back, but she actually had lost track of which day it was Uh, because every day is the same. You don't go anywhere. There aren't those external world sort of demarcations, boundaries, signs. It's the same four walls all day, every day, and your screen. So the loss of normalcy and the markers that we use to give us a sense of our own boundaries our own parameters, both in terms of what's familiar, but as you were saying, Lisa, that signal to us when we should move towards a particular behavior. You know, oh, it's 6 a.m., it's time to go to the gym. Well, now that's thwarted. Or, you know, it's Thursday night, that's when I shop. Oh, that's thwarted. 
that the way that we shape who we should be at a given moment mm-hmm. is now fallen away from the external world. And I don't necessarily feel that it's been picked up by internal imaginal markers mm-hmm. yet. Of You mean those boundaries between different uh, sections of our lives? And also the way we are signaled to shift ah, in yes. ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, for instance, I mean, I've been self-employed almost my entire life. I mean, starting from when I was a newspaper boy, when I was nine years old. When I, so having an internal sense of when it's time to do this or that, uh-huh. or what's on the list, or finding motivation and energy in myself to move forward, that's something that all of us that are self-employed are familiar with. But if we've depended on external structures to transition our behavior in one way or another, that's mm-hmm. a big transition. It's it's huge. And I go back to um, one of my theme songs here, which is, we are mammals. We are the creatures that we are. Uh, we don't criticize uh, zebras for running in a herd or uh, the elk for uh, bashing each other in the head every spring, competing for mates. And we are the we are animals that need external world stimulation. We need novelty. Uh, now I'm going here. Now it's time to do the grocery shopping. These little event changes and different environments and the signals they give us and our interaction, part of our basic uh, nature, I think. You know, that's really interesting, Deb. I want to pick up on that because I think we're, I think you brought in something new and important. We need structure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think as just therapists, we just kind of know that, right? That people do better when they have structure. And if you got someone who in your practice, who's really, you know, maybe unemployed and really depressed and, and you kind of ask like, what's your structure? Like, what do you do with your day? And, you know, it's a really, really bad sign when, they're not going to bed at the same time. They're not waking up at the same time. They don't have anywhere to go, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you might say like a sort of just sort of real supportive psychotherapy. You might be like, you need some structure. So we, we definitely do better with structure. And then Deb, you brought up this other thing of novelty. Yeah. And uh, we are wired to seek novelty, right? Isn't that, that's kind of part of what the whole dopaminergic system is, is you're, you're looking for, you're seeking, it's a seeking behavior. Mm-hmm. You're seeking something new, and and um, boy, that that is really really uh, curtailed now, isn't it? I mean, I was, uh, you know, someone the other day was just saying I, I used to go, you know, kind of always worked from home, but used to go and sit in a coffee shop and do it. And even if you're absorbed in your work, if you're sitting in a coffee shop, there's just a kind of constantly changing scene of different people. Even if you're not interacting with them, there's some novelty. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is really um, drives us very much, I think. I think that's a really important point. And the only new thing that most of us can bring into our lives these days is via our screens. I mean, if we're talking about outer world stimulation, we could then talk about, well, what about the inner world? But in terms of outer world novelty, we're limited. Yes, we're we're very limited. And... Uh, the novelty that it used to supply for me to take a break in the middle of the day, depending upon when that would fall, and do some errands or uh, go to the grocery store, which was a little bit of a change of scene and a change of pace, it is now not a pleasure. Mm. Mm. It is not a pleasure with everyone wearing masks and taped lines on the floor to have you keep your distance. Uh, so there's a kind of alertness and paying attention that has been brought into it and a wariness, a, a feeling tone that, that doesn't supply the kind of, hey, I'm taking a break and I'm running to the grocery store or dropping something off at the dry cleaner, which seems very mundane, but they create a change. And a shift mentally from thinking about something to something physical. As I'm listening, Deb, what I feel like we're tasked with 
trying to maintain some of these important structures through Zoom, is that we're tasked with substituting a tremendous amount of imagined experience for sensate experience. Yes. Which actually puts everybody in a slightly schizoid state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Say what, what is schizoid, Joseph, for people? We use that term in uh, psychoanalytic circles to describe the particular structure that some, someone's character might develop. And a schizoid structure is often a compensation for certain deprivations in the upbringing. And while we might be missing a lot of experiences or have a very difficult childhood, some people will naturally retreat into an inner world and create fantasy structures in order to compensate for things that are problematic in the outer world. That's a rather general way of describing it. And for a lot of people, that, that isn't how they function. So to be forced to find that kind of a, a way of being, it's very difficult. And I'm also, uh, my mind just jumped to uh, with the schizoid uh, state of being forced into sort of an inner world that becomes distanced uh, socially and distanced uh, in sensate ways. You know, I'm relating this uh, schizoid state that you spoke about, Joseph, to placing prisoners in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. and, and now it is really being talked about as a trauma and as inhumane. Uh, that is how contrary to our basic nature isolation is. Yeah, I think there have been a number of documentaries looking at the effect on prisoners of being isolated and self-destructive behavior, self-harming, uh, psychotic episodes. Mm -hmm. It's so, so difficult to manage that. And I think we start to see it. I mean, I, uh, I can't think of a single session that I've had for weeks that doesn't start with how are you doing during COVID? What's going on? Uh, there's a preoccupation and at the same time, a kind of fraying of, of sensate stuff. You know, do you have to really dress up anymore? Do you do your hair? Do you put on, if you're a woman, do you put on makeup? Uh, cause after all, nobody's really going to see me. Those markers of transition from home to work or s transition from home to social. Uh, aren't really there. There's some way that it's wonderful to connect over Zoom. Thank God we have it during this pandemic. But in other ways, oh, it's just not the same. I, I was thinking about also your prison reference there. And uh, I think that's really alive for people because there is this mounting reaction of kind of breaking out of prison. <laughs> you know, some of the governors have instituted very, very complicated, one might even argue excessive laws. This was happening in Minnesota recently. And, and that level of regulation does constellate a feeling of imprisonment. And for some people, then it's about staging the breakout. And we're seeing, you know, people with AK 47s, you know, marching around in the state house to stage their breakout experience. It's very complicated to predict how people are going to respond to being locked down. Well, on the one hand, uh, we're individuals and we're used to pursuing our individual goals. And on the other hand, uh, as a member of society, we're being asked or even required to behave a certain way as part of a collective and part of a collective response to this. And that brings us into, you know, some pretty interesting territory psychologically and especially in terms of depth psychology, because Jung was really interested in uh, the individual above all. He was interested in how life progresses through the lives, experience, memories of each individual. And of course, felt that, uh, 
the kind of mass man or mass psychology was much more shallow than what the individual could experience. And there's a way, in fact, that being required to follow these collective rules that are very, very constricting and constraining and essentially uh, condemning us to house arrest, as it were, does open up the possibility that we could be thrown back on ourselves and have to confront what is uh, in us and grow our roots very deeply into our own individual psychic experience during this time because there are fewer distractions. Well, I think that would be an ideal adaptation that we would see this limitation much the way you know, a, a meditator might choose to go into a silent retreat or even a meditation cell where it's just them and their blossoming experience of interiority. And yet those experiences are chosen and often prepared for rigorously in order to retreat inwardly productively. But yes, it is an opportunity for sure. So I think that we're being called to find a different kind of hero's journey, one that doesn't necessarily involve us leaving our houses, but rather looking within and deciding, what are my goals? What things really matter to me now? What do I need to do to achieve those? What are my values? And and does, does how I'm living line up with those values? And, and this can be true whether or not we're an 18-year-old who's just graduated from high school or we're, you know, a mid-career professional. You know, in this time when so much of what used to be dictated to me has been taken away and now I'm having this other thing dictated to me so that my freedom's curtailed, how do I want to live? How do I want to respond to that? How do I want to take responsibility for this time? There is a, there is a way in which... And I think this goes back to this kind of paternalism and these parental complexes that you guys referenced before. It can sort of feel like, well, the grownups are in charge. It's not on me. Um, I'm just going to sit here and, you know, get baked and watch Netflix. It's like, no, you may have to stay inside or not go to the gym or whatever it is. But you are still responsible for your life. And if your life now is taking place in the confines of your own home, mostly, you still get to decide how you're going to live it. And you still have responsibility for that time. And as a counterpoint to that, I'll say there are so many people that come to my sessions these days and they say, I'm not using this time very well. You know, I have an invented calculus. And I, and I sort of say, Hey, 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 slow down. You know, did you get through the day? Did you get, done what you need to get done, then you're doing great. So there can be this way that we can have exalted expectations of ourselves. And that's not really what I'm talking about. It's that are we kind of getting up every day and putting one foot in front of the other and doing what we need to do? So what this constellates in me is the idea of the precocious individuation, that in an environment that is not interrupted, people might not have those concerns until they were 35 years old, that people would drift along based on what the culture provides. People would show up at university and they would receive the syllabus. They would receive the program after which four years they're going to, you know, pop out, go to their internship, get ready for the next job. But now we're asking young people, maybe 20-year-olds, 19-year-old young people to take on an individuation task that normally might be 15 years forward. That's just what's required right now. So I, I respond to your pragmatism about it, Lisa. But I'm also curious, and this is just an idea I'm floating, are there costs to a precocious individuation? Do we lose something when that happens? Well, I think we do. Uh, one part of the psyche uh, may seize the challenge and progress precociously, uh, while another part of the psyche has not had the kind of spaciousness needed uh, to develop. 
And we see that sometimes in, in kids who have a difficult uh, home life and they become precociously self-reliant uh, and capable, self-sufficient. And then later on, we discover that some part of the psyche that needed to be young, creative, carefree, innocent, expressive, uh, had had to be tamped down. So uh, I think in a way, you know, I think we need to recognize that there is a kind of trauma to this for all kinds of people, young people who are supposed to be out and about in college and socializing, but also for mothers and fathers, too, who are cooped up with kids trying to work their own jobs uh, online, cook meals, uh, get their kids to sit down and do their homework remotely, and are really frazzled. Uh, reports of domestic violence have been I increasing. So I agree completely. I mean, this is what is, and uh, that can't be changed. And we need to do the best we can to take responsibility despite the constraints. I'm thinking as you were talking, Deb, that one of the costs is that there will be unmediated archetypal effects, that there are all kinds of transpersonal archetypal forces that are pressing into us as a young person. And one of the ways that we incarnate the archetypes is by being in a world that provides experiences of all different kinds. And the lived experiences then coat the archetypes so that we have a sense of what they are in the real world. When we're forced into an individuation before that can happen, then the archetypes themselves patch into the psychic structure to allow things to move forward. And then later in life, that stitch has to be picked up that's been lost. You know, I'm sort of thinking that, I mean, one of you just said this sort of is what it is. I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite mm -hmm. young quotes, which is the right way to wholeness is full of fateful detours and wrong turnings. Uh, and it could be that our COVID-19 crisis will become for each of us or, or could become for each of us just kind of grist for the individuation mill that this is our challenge. This is the challenge of, you know, different generations are experiencing the challenge differently, but we will meet it how we meet it. And, and it could bring out the best in us. It could bring out the worst in us, but uh, we each have somewhat of a choice about that. We have a choice about the kind of attitude we hold uh, toward it. Circling back to this idea of the archetypal patch and even thinking of your idea, Lisa, that the hero's journey must continue and that parts of the hero's journey is going to be fueled by unmediated archetypes, which later on in life are going to have to be addressed. It may very well be that a generation of young people are going to have a specific piece of work to take on in 10 or 20 years, which is very interesting in a certain way that it may make a demand upon the culture in order to make that shift. Yeah, I do worry about the the kids who are sort of in college now or, or maybe just finishing college. I, I, I do worry that this is going to exacerbate sort of failure to launch syndrome. It could be failure to launch. I could also imagine that there may be expectations or hopes that are not well grounded in how the world works that they're left in a slightly fantastical place because they haven't had a chance to really buffer up against mm -hmm. it in a lived life. Yeah, I can uh, really appreciate that. The image that comes up for me is uh, when deer grow their antlers and there's a kind of fuzz on the antlers that has to be rubbed off uh, with, with other deer and with trees and so on that there's a stage of life that's kind of like that for young people. If you're supposed to be out there. You're supposed to be rubbing up against peers and uh, teachers and bosses and just life itself. It's hard, and it's, it's a real problem and a real difficulty that I don't think any of us are minimizing, 
here we are with uh, these extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> One almost wants to say unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. And yeah. yet I think even theorizing about the impact can help parents, for instance, orient with a deeper understanding of what might be required, just as you said, Lisa, that it may be a slower launching process because certain experiences still haven't landed fully. Educational systems also may have to make accommodations, which they are right now. But one of the things I that I hope doesn't happen is that universities and colleges don't decide to shut down their physical campuses and do everything online. So much of the initiation into adulthood involves kind of getting out of your parents' house and living somewhere else and being in a city of other young people and delaying that is a challenge. And mm -hmm. I think delaying that in such a large segment of the population and perhaps even permanently if education is delivered differently is going to put a stress perhaps creatively so on the culture to create other transitional structures mm -hmm. one of the things that we haven't talked about that uh, sort of fits in this immediate context uh, uh, is the stress that uh, so many people are feeling uh, who've lost their jobs mm. And uh, may have families to support, and there's been uh, you know, government financial programs and assistance and rent forgiveness and various other things that I don't think are working very seamlessly for people, uh, to say the least. But that that's another kind of life stage stress, that when you have uh, rent to pay and a job to go to and food to buy, of what that does to the psyche when uh, somehow your, your very means of agency and effectiveness, responsibility, and, and a kind of real pride are uh, undermined and taken away. Yeah, taken away, you know, a, a, an attachment to meaning and purpose. I mean, if you're your family's breadwinner and you can't do that, where does that leave you? Mm -hmm. The loss of identity. Exactly. Uh, and uh, that, that there is a part of the COVID lockdown that is incredibly sad. Mm -hmm. So much loss. I mean, we're not even talking about death, I think, but just loss of jobs, loss of opportunities, loss of connections. And loss of a sense of agency uh, and identity, as you said, Joseph, of, of this is who I am. I, I work here. I earn this much money. I pay the bills. We're thrown back on ourselves here in a way that, um, you know, unlike an external threat that, that spurs us to action and activation, this external threat forces us uh, into a kind of motionlessness mm -hmm. that can become apathy. Or even kind of nihilism. Yeah. Like nothing matters. Yeah. There's also a, a reality that many of us who are living further out in rural areas don't fully appreciate. It's a little bit like taking refuge in a bunker right before some kind of nuclear accident. And then some years later, you emerge from the bunker and discover that the landscape has been reshaped. That some of my friends who had been living in Manhattan and have now fled to other areas, that when they think of coming back to Manhattan, they're realizing that the Manhattan that they left doesn't exist anymore. That some young people that I'm friends with are asking, like, why would I go back to Manhattan? Because the reasons for living in Manhattan won't be there. Mm -hmm. The theater stuff is closed down. Restaurants are gone. And again, the, this fantasy that you can just restart everything with the turn of the key just isn't true. It could take years for a major urban area to actually regenerate the culture that it used to have, which is one of the reasons why people wanted to live there. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about Manhattan because it's 
in the news a lot, but this same event is happening in Chicago. It's happening in all kinds of large urban areas. So this reshaping of the outer landscape is really significant and people are beginning to sense it and it's beginning to break up into consciousness without a real clear solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like what exactly does this mean? What exactly does it look like to th- for now for things to quote unquote go back to normal? And, and what will it what will it be like to live in a city? I mean, I lived in Philadelphia and it's like, why do I live in a city? There's, <laughs> there's no restaurants, there's no shops, you know, like you said, all the things that make a city a wonderful place to be are irrelevant at this point. And, you know, we'll come back at some point, but in some altered form. So in a way, uh, we've talked about the the personal complexes uh, that this COVID virus can throw us into, but there's also a huge cultural complex. We're in a collective uh, complex as well of all these things that are shut down and affected and simply missing. And we we feel it in the fear and in the news and all the rest of it. So it's inside us as individuals, however we may be experiencing it. And it's also out there in the external world all around us from cultural things to our jobs to governance and uh, how people experience it in their different states. We're really in a complex. The we are in the COVID complex. Mm-hmm. And maybe it can help, uh, just as it does with any other complex, to just know that. So that then we have some hope of having the complex instead of the complex just having us. And that may be all we can do for right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hi, this is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. I'm viewing media footage filmed from a helicopter looking down onto the forward section of the fast-moving 60-foot solo sailing yacht that is headed out to sea. The yacht is hard to the wind, keeling over, plunging through a 1.5-meter sea with ocean spray sweeping over the bow. The sky is overcast, the sea gray, the wind is blowing over 25 knots, and the land is out of sight and astern. A man, a solo sailor of approximately 70 years, dressed in yellow wet-weather gear, is steadily making his way aft from the bow of the yacht toward the stern. He is moving in a crouch, using a hand for support in an experienced and careful manner. As he moves, he is also tending to the headsail that is temporarily impaired by the lifelines. He is caring in his attention to the sail. A news commentator is wishing the sailor well as he embarks on a long offshore passage. I am yearning. This will one day be me embarking on such a passage, and I am empathizing with the harmony that the sailor is demonstrating toward the yacht by smoothing the sail and his experienced movements in challenging conditions. Suddenly, the sailor looks up toward the stern and breaks into a run toward the stern. However, his foot catches 
on a fixed piece of rigging and he trips, falling forward, hitting his head hard on the deck. The news commentator is saying that this is the last time the sailor was seen or heard from and is now missing at sea. I am thinking, how could it be the last time he was seen, as there were people recording the footage and flying the helicopter? I can't understand how he could be missing. I wake up feeling shaken and bewildered. He offers a bit of context. I am in therapy starting to work through midlife, childhood trauma, and psychological dismemberment relating to early childhood and teenage experiences at a boarding school. I was in a highly emotional and vulnerable state at the time of the dream, having experienced intense active fantasies and imaginations in recent weeks, and in addition, had experienced a perceived moment of doubt toward the therapist in the session that day. I am a father of a family of four with two late-age teenagers who are uncertain about my recent application to reading and listening to Jungian psychology, whilst handwriting pages of learnings, thought streams, and recollections. Prior to this, I relentlessly pursued one physical activity after another in pursuit of mine and the children's happiness. The main feelings in the dream were empathy, aspiration, and bewilderment. And he offers a little bit more explanation. He writes, I sailed on yachts in a cruising capacity for three years in my early twenties. During this time, in the tropics near the equator, I had an experience of enlightenment and peace that came about after repeated days of being in a meditative state. I have strong emotional ties to the ocean and yachts. Your thoughts around ego shadow and the unconscious would be most appreciated amongst anything else that you choose to discuss. So, a very meticulously described boating experience. Yes, I noticed that the, especially in the beginning, you know, it's a 1.5 meter sea and the wind's at 25 knots and the, <laughs> you know, it, it's I, what my first thought was, I wonder if this person has a strong sensation function. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose sometimes they say the devil is in the details, but the numinous is in the details as well. Yeah. And of course, he has life experience uh, with uh, yachts and sailing in the ocean. You know, I'm just thinking of the image of, of ships and the sea and how um, parallel that is to the relationship between the ego and the unconscious. Uh, and somewhere Jung says that we are all little chips uh, floating on the vast sea of the unconscious. So I've translated chips to ships, and uh, and there he is. But he is, the dream ego is not in the dream. He's uh, an observer. Yeah, and sailing is a particularly good metaphor, I think, for the individuation process, mm -hmm. because one has to orient toward the ocean, but also toward the wind. Mm -hmm and uh, kind of come into proper relationship with it in order to keep moving forward. And the ego has to do its part. Yes. Uh, you have to man the sails, climb the rigging, uh, you know, all of those operations. So it's a really uh, powerful interactive process. A and skilled sailors are in right relationship to the wind and the sea. The message that is constellating in me relative to the dream, and perhaps as a compensation for how he navigates in life, is that meticulous clarity of detail does not guarantee the mastery of nature and the unconscious. That it is not a bulwark against the depths of the unconscious. And that in a venture, like setting across the sea in a, in a great yacht, still requires the support and approval of the unconscious in order to safely make that journey. And the dream seems to be suggesting this internal sailor did not gain support at all the levels that he might have needed to make the journey safely. 
I'm going to pick up on that and maybe say something similar in my own words, which is, uh, you know, he, he says in his associations that his two older teens are, he says they're uncertain because, I mean, my, my translation, he's now beginning to read and listen to Jungian psychology and he's writing pages and pages. And I'm hearing that he's approaching it almost, I want to use the word a little obsessively. And he then says, before this, I relentlessly pursued one physical activity after another in pursuit of mine and my children's happiness so that so that I hear that this is a person that whatever he takes on, he really throws himself into it. And, you know, we, we see that to a certain extent in how the dream is reported, that there's all of the, this attention to detail. And, and I think I'm just picking up, Joseph, exactly on, on what you're saying, that one has to be careful in uh, almost overvaluing an egoic approach to these kinds of things because the ego might latch on to it and I'm going to read everything there is to read on Jung and I'm going to take note, you know, pages and pages and pages of notes and it, it, still, it still might not be what the psyche is, is requiring or there might be something missing. The sailor, the 70-year-old sailor gets tripped up. Yes, and he hits his head hard on the deck uh, so I think we're all um, kind of on the same point about uh, the egoic stance uh, versus nature versus, you know, here depicted as the sea, the unconscious. And that in the end, that's what will have its way with us. And what he hits is his head and he's missing at sea. So the head is that thinking part of us, the uh, cognition. Uh, although earlier in this dream, he references the, the tenderness that the sailor uh, exhibits toward the sail, that he tends the sail um, and he smooths the sail. However, it is temporarily impaired by the lifelines. So that would be my question is, uh, what are, where are your lifelines? What are we talking about here? That what you want to do and where you want to sail is in opposition or is being impaired somehow by lifelines. Yeah, and and you know this idea that he hits his head hard, and so there's this kind of uh, um, blow to the kind of thinking stance, and then he's lost at sea. I mean, to be lost at sea psychologically might portend getting kind of drowning in the unconscious a bit. So it's hard not to hear this dream as a bit of a warning, I think. Writing on what you had said, Deb, about the lifelines, I was also thinking about the solo journey on the trip. And this is a man who has lifelines with a wife or a partner and two late-age teenagers. So those lifelines would trip up your capacity to go off alone and have a great journey. And sometimes in midlife, people can feel that their familial obligations are blocking them from the next or what they feel to be a necessary solo journey. And that can be concretized in a way that is unfortunate, where it should remain internal. So many people in midlife feel that they have to change the outer circumstances, you know, perhaps leave the family go and live in Bali for a couple of years, you know, in a hut or some other version of that. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> right now, there you go. But often, as the person in the dream, uh, the dream submitter had suggested, it can be a solo internal journey. And the truth is, most internal journeys are solo, that no one really can go with you, even though you might describe the journey. You have to take this sailing trip into the unconscious and contend with what is thrown up. What do we make of this sort of observational or sublimatio kind of stance? That the dream starts uh, that he's viewing media footage filmed from a helicopter looking down. Uh, into this fast-moving, solo-sailed yacht. So he's up above, looking down, and then at the end he returns to that, uh, that the news commentator 
says this is the last time the sailor was heard from. And how could it be the last time as there were people recording and filming footage and flying the helicopter? This dual observational stance and then all the action in the sailboat with the sailor. So I wonder if it points in a way that's um, perhaps helpful to the ability to be in kind of have an observing ego, you know, that, that he's not actually in this experience or he's not entirely identified with this experience, but can also be watching it. But there's also something for me in this about being removed from it in a way that feels a little bit like, again, kind of too, maybe too much thinking, too, too much thinking. And, and, and partly where that goes for me is that, you know, sometimes when you're watching like a nature program and they're, they're showing you like the fox about to kill the rabbit and you're like, oh, why can't the cameraman just save the rabbit? You know, <laughs> the thing is that, it, that if this really happened, if there were a helicopter shooting footage of a solo sailing yacht and you saw the sailor get hit in the head and get swept off, like what would happen? Like immediately the guys in the helicopter would radio for help or, you know, they, they try to do something, right? So there's some kind of absence or lack of warmth or or empathy or ability to get close to that experience as well. So I, I see it as kind of both things, maybe. I'm seeing it as a lot of things, but one of the things I wonder about is that he's distanced uh, from from this experience, this very powerful experience of a solo yacht being sailed in these choppy seas and the one man on board hits his head hard and then disappears uh, so that there's a disconnect, a disconnect between uh, observer and, and the action, as it were, of, of the movie. And I, I also wonder who died here, you know, or who disappeared. The 70-year-old man who was tending the sail, smoothing it, attentive, what happened? What has disappeared? What's been lost? Along those lines, Deb, the media footage is filmed from a helicopter and this fellow is watching it, which also suggests that this is in retrospect. This is an event that may have happened at any mm -hmm. time in the past, yeah. although the viewing of it has a sense of immediacy to him. So it mm -hmm. evokes a fantasy that the 70-year-old Odysseus hero, you know, has, has fallen, as you said, into the unconscious and distressingly was not rescued by the observers. I'm wondering if at some point in his life, the father complex as a hero failed, fell into the unconscious, and in some way has alienated him from his own sense of being able to take a heroic journey. And the dream might be bringing his attention back to that, to ask this question of, where is my inner hero, my inner Odysseus now? Should it be resurrected? Can it be resurrected? Why might he want it to be resurrected? And the distress here is that he can't find it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I like that, Joseph. I think that adds a lot. The last amplification, which I, I'm going to suggest, I feel like it's a bit of a long shot because um, it's a somewhat not perfect fit. But I'm thinking about the Greek myth of Agamemnon, who is on his way to the Trojan War, and he offends one of the gods and as a result, his ship is not permitted to move forward. I believe he offends Artemis. And then she requires a terrifying sacrifice of his daughter in order for the winds to return and the ship to continue on to the Trojan War. That's not exactly what's happening in the dream. But there is this sense that a, a journey has been thwarted despite the best efforts of the hero, it makes me just curious 
if there has been some offense to the gods, some conflict deep in the psyche which would require a substantial sacrifice in order for the journey to continue. If the myth of Agamemnon is accurate, it might require the sacrifice of some kind of boyishness, a kind of childishness in the psyche in order for the journey to happen. And that is a very common sacrifice on a hero's journey, that the child has to be surrendered, perhaps a childlike attitudes, childlike dependencies, in order for these internal blessings from the unconscious to be bestowed. Again, it feels like it's a bit of a stretch, but it might have a resonance. Yeah, it's an interesting place to go. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.